I titled my sermon today, Jesus, Risen, Reigning, and Returning. And uh, every Easter, I love to look at the, the Easter story, the accomplishments of Christ from a little different angle. And I thought this year we would look at it from uh, a number of different references, but especially from his exaltation uh, to the right hand of the Father uh, that Paul speaks about in Philippians 2. Um, I want to set the stage a little bit by talking about uh, some of his work that we, we men- mentioned on Thursday night here at our service. Uh, but it is, it is spectacular. What a passage we have in Philippians 2. So three primary focal points today of Christ. Risen, reigning, and returning. Let's jump in here. First of all, the life of Jesus matters. The life of Jesus matters. Sometimes the emphasis is upon his death, and that is right. It is good. There was so much accomplished there. But even before his death, there had to be a requirement met. That requirement was righteousness. Friends, it's a requirement that no one here in this room has met on our own. We are not righteous in and of ourselves. We are unrighteous. We are sinners. We are sinners by nature and by choice. We don't have to teach children how to be selfish how to lie or to steal comes naturally to us. It is who we are. If left to ourselves, we will run that race all the way to the grave. But friends, Jesus never sinned. Jesus was without sin. He was, he was tempted and tested in every way, yet without sin. And that is one of the reasons why he was qualified then to then go to the cross to pay for the sins of others because he wasn't paying for his own sins. And so the life of Jesus matters to us. The death of Jesus also matters to us. His atoning sacrifice for sin. When he was placed on that cross, he took upon himself the sin of all who would believe in him in faith and he paid it in full. In full. The Father poured the full wrath upon the Son that I deserve for all the sins I've ever committed. How how many would that number add up to? I guarantee you this, it's a million times more than the highest number you can think of. (laughs) We are are so flattering of ourselves when we think of how good we are. Yes, people on the street, are you a good person? Oh, yeah, I'm a good person. Compared to who? Compared to who? Compared to the perfect standard of holiness and righteousness of God? We all fall short, it says. We are all sinners. But Jesus took upon himself all of that sin that I have committed, that anyone who looks to him in faith has committed, and he paid it in full, the atoning sacrifice. However, if that was the end of the story, we would be in trouble, friends, because a dead Savior is no Savior. A dead Savior who is not alive, who has no victory over death, is not a Savior who can truly save because our problem would remain, wouldn't it? Death is coming for us all. None of us can say that today is not our last. We don't know. We know that it is the Lord who ordains our days. He is the one who keeps your heart beating this very moment. He makes the air that you breathe in keep you alive. So, What we need is more than just the life of Christ. What we need is more than just the atoning sacrifice of Christ. We need an empty tomb. And friends, that's why Easter is such a big deal. Resurrection Sunday matters immensely to us. And then the ascension of Christ to sit at the right hand of the Father. His work is done. He is seated, seated at the right hand of the Father, ruling and reigning. So these are things that we're going to look more closely at as we move through here today. Number one, risen in victory. The Easter story, I want to spend some time building this out and considering this from a few different angles. Risen in victory. Paul says this to the Corinthian church, if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. Think of this. There's a lot of dead, quote unquote, messiahs out there, isn't there? They're in the ground. They perished. They are false messiahs. The true messiah can't be held by death. Death can't hold the one who is and is without sin. The God 
who created all things, he is not bound by death. He surrendered to death, and then he conquered death. So, let's consider this. Jesus predicted his own resurrection. This always blows my mind. When you're reading through the Gospels, I was struck, even in, in the Gospel of Mark, the shortest Um, Jesus three different times specifically said, this is what's going to happen. This is what I'm going to do. And it's like the disciples, it just went right over their heads. They're hearing words and they're like, oh yeah, okay, sure, Jesus. What? A a Messiah that, that, that dies? How does that fit with our expectations? It just didn't make sense to them until after when he was raised. Then all of this teaching began to kind of fall into place. Mark 10, taking the 12 again, he began to tell them what was going to happen to him. So Jesus is prophesying about his own work. See, we are going up to Jerusalem and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes. That's exactly what happened. And they will condemn him to death. Remember under cover of darkness that Thursday night, all those midnight trials, all that made up uh, accusation and, 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 and they did what they could to condemn him to death and they delivered him over to the Gentiles, that is the Romans, so that by nine o'clock, it says they, they will mock him and spit on him and flog him, every single one of these things they did and then they will kill him. At nine o'clock, they put him on a cross and for six hours, Jesus held on to this cross, pushing up on the nails to to draw breath into his lungs so that he could breathe and then back down and up to breathe. Six hours of agony. The physical agony was enough to kill anybody, but it was far more than that. The agony of wrath, the full cup of the wrath of God the Father was being poured out on Jesus in those six hours. 3 p.m., he gave up his spirit. He said these words, friends. Oh, I love these words. It is finished. Paid in full, right? That's what that means. Atonement, full atonement has been made. But then he says this to the disciples. Three different times he says this. And after three days, the Son of Man will rise. After three days, I'm going to rise. Now, those words especially, they were, they, who does this? Who's, what's, what does this mean? And all of a sudden, Resurrection Sunday, the light switch flipped, and they understood. Jesus says this in John 10, I lay down my life that I might, may take it up again. No one takes it from me. Let's be clear. You think the Romans are surprising me with this? This is the whole reason I was sent. No one takes my life from me. I lay it down of my own accord and I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This is the charge that he received from God the Father. The mission of redemption that Jesus was fulfilling. Now the historical event of the resurrection, there's a lot of attack on the historicity of the resurrection. In fact, the Romans worked hard at this when it took place. They were They were appalled that this had gone down the way it had. And so uh, they did everything to try to make it a conspiracy theory, a cover-up. Oh, this is just made-up stuff. Well, the reality is, my friends, there was no hiding this. This was like citywide event, the historical event of the bodily resurrection of Christ. Listen to how it went down. After the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and then sat on it. I I love that. He's like, that's the biggest stone you guys got? (laughs) Is that all you can do? So he's just hanging out, sitting on a stone. But to be clear, Whenever angels are beheld in Scripture, it is not a cherub. This is not a cute little chubby baby with a bow and arrow who shoots hearts. This is a fearsome, angelic warrior. 
His appearance was like lightning. His clothing was white as snow. What does that mean? It doesn't just mean that it was white. It means without blemish, without sin, righteous, pure, obedient to God. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. They went catatonic. They, they were so afraid. It's like they were paralyzed laying on the ground. Roman guards? Okay, just think. These are no pushover type military men. They were tasked to guard the tomb. These are a special group. This is like Roman special forces. Catatonic before this angel. The angel said to the women, do not be afraid. There's that command, the most often repeated command in Scripture. Do not fear. Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen. As he said, he did exactly what he said he would do. Jesus is not a liar. He fulfills his word. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go and quickly tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee, and there you will see him. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy. What a great mix that is. Friends, that is a, that's a good mix when it comes to our engaging with the Lord and his works and his ways. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, right? We don't just trot around and, 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 and pilfer around with the Lord. No, we walk in with, with trembling and awe of His greatness, but with great joy because of what He has done. His great love has met us in our need. They ran with fear and great joy to tell the disciples, and behold, as they're running, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. <laughs> Those moments, if you could just experience those moments. They're running. I don't know if Jesus is jogging. You know, runs up next to him. Greetings. <laughs> I, how, did it, how did it go down? I could see Jesus blowing their minds. That word sums up so much right there. They came up, took hold of his feet, and they worshipped him. What does that mean? They, they hit the ground. They bowed in humble, reverent worship of the risen Savior. That is the right response to Jesus Christ. That is the only fitting response for people like us, sinners, who are undeserving of this love of God. Now, there were many witnesses of the resurrection. It wasn't just this handful of people. It wasn't just a small little group. Uh, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, when he's sharing the gospel, he says, I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. Just as Scripture uh, prophecy had predicted, it went down exactly as it is said. And that He appeared to Cephas, that is Peter, and then to the twelve, and then to more than 500 brothers at one time. Okay? Then he appeared to James, and then to all the apostles, and last of all, as to one untimely born, Paul says. He's like, man, I, I was like the last one to meet him. But he appeared to me as well. This is when Paul was saved. You remember this? Jesus knocks Paul off his horse as he's persecuting and imprisoning and killing Christians and he says, I choose you. I save you. I send you. You're mine. You're mine. Awesome. The risen Savior in power, in glory. So the implications of the resurrection are far, far reaching. This just scratches the surface, but I have to share at least four things here that have great significance for us today. Number one, it is confirmation that the Father accepted the atoning sacrifice of Christ. It is, it is, it is the, the stamp of approval. He is well pleased with His Son, not only in His obedience, but in His sufferings. By His stripes, we are healed, says Isaiah. The sacrifice for sin is accepted 
That is confirmation from an empty tomb. Secondly, Satan is disarmed. Oh, think of how Satan would have thought he had won on Saturday. I often think about the silence of Saturday. The disciples, heartbroken, completely at a loss, devastated to have witnessed the brutal murder of the world's most innocent man. And it's silent. Satan must have been rejoicing and celebrating, but then (laughs) realizing very quickly that he had actually succeeded in accomplishing his own demise. He was disarmed. He disarmed the rulers and authorities, triumphing over them in Christ. Death was also defeated. This is our great enemy, my friends. The great enemy of our experience on this life. Why do we die? What, why do we die? Because we sin. We die because we sin. That's the reality. Death is the curse of God set upon sinners. It started in Genesis 3 when Adam and Eve rebelled and disobeyed God. The curse fell there and that is when death began to define our reality. But for those who put faith in Jesus Christ, it is not death to die. (laughs) Death is disarmed. I like how John Piper says it. He says, death is like my car. It takes me where I want to go. You you see what I'm saying? Death is a door to the very presence of Jesus Christ. That is why, my friends, I can stand here and tell you without any doubt Dean Crosswhite is not dead. He is alive, more alive than ever, in the presence of his Savior. No pain, no cancer, no heartache, no suffering. It's hard to say goodbye, but oh, we don't grieve as those without hope. We know our Savior lives. And that's the last point on here future resurrection death is not the final word for our physical bodies either yes when we die our bodies are laid to rest in the grave ashes to ashes dust to dust but for the believer only a limited time right that grave is going to break forth in life upon the return of christ our bodies will be raised jesus is the first fruits of resurrection it means he's the first one to show us what it looks like to come flying out of the grave equipped, glorified, ready for eternity. We will receive glorified bodies. We will live on a real, newly created heaven and earth with dirt and and a physical reality. We'll recognize one another because your body counts. The body that God made for you, He exists, uh, he, He intends for His glory with it and He will redeem it, not just your soul. Your body will be redeemed forever. All of this flows because of the empty tomb. It's all hope for us. Look at the connection here in some of these verses. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. The gave there means he, he, he gave him to die in our place. That whoever believes in him, hear this this morning, regardless of your past, regardless of the mess of your life, regardless of all of the horrible experiences, regardless of the things you've chosen in rebellion against God, whoever believes in Jesus Christ will not perish, will not be poured wrath upon in the fires of hell forever, will not perish eternally, but will have eternal life. Jesus says in John 6, this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in Him should have eternal life. And then, I love these words, and I will raise Him up on the last day. What does that mean? It means your body and your soul will be reunited to be together with the Lord forever. So, the victory of the resurrection we have by faith in Jesus. His victory over the grave is ours by faith. 
His triumph over Satan and sin and death and hell is ours by faith. You can't earn it. By, by works of the flesh, by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight. You can't be good enough to earn this. That's actually good news. The reality is, friends, only sinners go to heaven. Only sinners go to heaven. Good people, in their own estimation, do not make the cut. It is the people who bend their knee, who bow before a right and righteous Savior and say, save me from myself, from my sin, from my rebellion. Save me from the wrath of a righteous God that I deserve. These are the people who are blessed with life and forgiveness, with victory. So, the Lord Jesus Christ is risen in victory. Second, He is reigning in sovereignty. Sometimes we don't emphasize this enough. I love this point uh, of the reality of our risen Savior. He is not just risen. He is reigning today in sovereignty. Here's Philippians 2, verses 8 to 11 here, 8b. He humbled Himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, Listen to the implications then. Listen to the Father's response. Therefore, God has highly exalted Him and bestowed on Him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is what? Lord. Lord. Sovereign is what that means to the glory of God the Father. He is exalted to the highest place. The focal point of all of redemptive history is Christ Jesus. He humbled Himself and He died. And He was exalted by the Father to sit at His right hand. There's a lot of things here in these verses that should jump out to us. I was struck by the word every. Every name. His name is bigger, higher, more treasured, more valuable, above every name. Jesus. And every knee. Every single knee should bow. It's kind of an interesting way of saying it. We tend to say bend the knee, but the, the knee is to bow. To bow before him and every tongue every every single person who has ever lived on the face of this earth who will ever live every angel every demon cannot deny his lordship in fact you see this on display even the demons they know who jesus is and they're scared of him they, they fear Him, even though they don't worship Him. Every knee will bow. He is the Savior of sinners, but more than that, He is sovereign over all. Friends, there have been times in the church where the emphasis has been upon Jesus as Savior, but, but has not rightly added to that on, on the, the emphasis of Jesus as Lord, Master, King, Ruler of life. I would just say, if you are looking to Jesus as your Savior, but you live as if you have no king, you may have misunderstood the gospel. You cannot, let me just say this really, really clearly, you cannot have Jesus as Savior and compartmentalize Him over here and then live your life as if He does not exist. As if somehow the sins that he died for are paid for over here and they're still wonderfully attractive over here every day that you live your life. You are not saved if you live that way. Many will say, Lord, Lord, didn't we come to Good Shepherd? Didn't we, weren't we there on Easter Sunday singing and, and things? And he will say to many, don't miss that, many will hear this. Depart from me. Workers of lawlessness. I don't know you. Let's be clear. 
The gospel is not easy belie- believism. You don't just say a prayer, get Jesus as fire insurance, and then live however you want. The call is surrender all. He is everything to you. He is not only Savior, but King, Lord, Ruler, Sovereign. That's the Gospel. He demands all. Every knee, every tongue, whether willingly or unwillingly, will be forced someday to bow and acknowledge Him. So the kingdom of Christ, that is his rule and reign, the kingdom of Christ is breaking into Whatcom County. It's it's reflected right here in this room. The kingdom of Christ is this. It is anywhere and any place where the rule and the reign of Christ is recognized and honored, valued, and treasured. So these three words, treasuring Christ above all else. Do you want to understand sin more fully? Well, Sin is anything that you treasure more than Jesus Christ. Put it in those terms. That's idolatry. We don't tend to make these little golden things and bow before them and light candles and pray to them anymore. If you do, that's also a problem. Okay? (laughs) In our day, we tend to make idols out of things that have engines and things that have many rooms and bedrooms or people. People. We put people on pedestals. You can make an idol out of almost anything. But the call of the Christian, the kingdom call, is treasure Christ above all else. Trust Him. Trust Him and Him alone. We are saved through faith alone in Christ alone. Not in in us. So the the call of the culture is, well, you've got to just believe in yourself. Um, I hate to break it to you. That's hogwash. That is hogwash. The Bible never says that. Let's be clear. The Bible never says, hey, in order to be a successful, wonderful person on this earth, you have to believe in yourself. That's not true. You are called to believe in Christ. Trust in Him. We are weak. He is strong. I am not enough. I don't have this, girlfriend. Right? (laughs) We don't. We don't have this. He does. He does. The whole point of your life is to point to Him. Every breath you breathe is Jesus. He's everything to me. Trust Him, treasure Him, and obey Him. I exist for you. My days are yours. My career is yours. My life is yours. My recreation time is yours. My family is yours. My purpose in this life, it's all about you. Everywhere he puts you. That's the kingdom of God. So, number three, returning in glory. Risen in victory, reigning in sovereignty, and returning in glory. Our king is coming again. Listen to this. Acts 9, when Jesus ascended up into the clouds to sit at the right hand of the Father, it says, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him up out of their sight. Jesus is talking like this and, and, and teaching them, and all of a sudden he starts going up in the air, doing the Jesus thing, you know, like up in the air. And then they're like, he's really going up high this time. And, and then he's off in the clouds. They're gazing into heaven as he went. And behold, two men stood by them in white robes. Who are these? These are angels. And they're like, you can just see them. They're just staring at these guys who are looking up into heaven. Like, what, you know, is, it, is something else going to happen? And they're, they're like, hey, uh, men of Galilee, why are you staring up into the sky? <laughs> this Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way you saw him go into heaven. He will descend. He will descend in power. His first coming, the entrance was quiet. It's a Christmas story, right? Jesus was born in a no-name town to no-name people, celebrated by no buddies, invited by the angels. The shepherds came in awe. King Herod, the somebody of the day, was just a few miles away sitting in a palace while Jesus was born in a shepherd's cave with a bunch of animals and a bunch of smelly, well, 
you get the idea. It was a mess that night. Not the arrival of the King of Kings you would expect. That's his first coming. Friends, don't think that his return is going to come like that again. His purpose in his first coming was to save, to be the suffering servant, to pour his life out, to teach, and to call people to repent. But his second coming is altogether different. He rides triumphantly on a white horse to make war on the nations, and he will tread them down in wrath. Listen to some of these verses. Jesus says, Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay everyone for what he has done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. More from Revelation on this. We studied this as a church recently. It was just a spectacular study. It says that as Jesus rides in on his white war horse, It says, from his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. How did the Son of God create? He spoke, let there be, let there be, let there be, and there was. How is he going to return? The word of his mouth will strike the nations down like a double-edged sword. He will cut men down in their sins. They will fall under His righteous wrath. He will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread. Listen to the imagery here, the the wording. Jesus will tread the winepress. What does that look like? Well, you get in the grapes and you stomp the grapes under your feet, crushing them. That is the imagery here of Jesus in fury. The winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has the name written, King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. What leader of what government that you can think of right now is going to stand up to him? There's a lot of answering to be done. A whole lot of wickedness will receive its recompense. Friend, don't be one crushed under His foot in wrath. Run to Him today in repentance of your sins. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will repay. The whole context of this, we're going to study this Uh, next week the whole context of this is we are not to avenge ourselves and the basis of our showing grace and forgiveness and mercy is because we know that someday justice will fall fierce and true retribution will be just dealt out by christ vengeance is mine says the lord i will repay now when was the last time you heard that preached in church What's wrong with our current church that, that broadly speaking, we are not hearing enough about the wrath of God, about the vengeance of the King of kings and the Lord of lords? How come there isn't more of a call to repent of sin and turn? This is the gospel. This is the gospel. This isn't hellfire and brimstone out of left field, an echo of the past. No, This is the Word of God. And our generation has grown soft hearing only about the warm fuzzies and not about the reality of of righteous wrath. I tell you, Jesus says, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. You're, You're wondering what level of detail we answer for? It's that. If the God who knows the numbers of hair, hairs on your head at this moment keeps track of sin the same way He keeps track of hair, then we need a Savior. You see, the cross of Jesus Christ does not only say 
volumes about the love of God. It says volumes about how serious sin is. We need to feel that before we'll ever appreciate the grace we've been shown in the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to to the Father except through me. You're not good enough to come on your own. You can give that up. That's like jumping across the Grand Canyon. doesn't work. You might impress your neighbor by jumping a little farther. You're all going to perish. That, 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 you're just not going to launch that far. Jesus is the only bridge to cross that chasm of sin and hell. There is no other Savior. In a day that's all about tolerance and everybody's right and your truth is your truth. No. Jesus says this. I am the truth. I am the way. I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Not Muhammad. Not Buddha. Not anyone. Not Joseph Smith. Not the Pope. Fill in the blanks. Not your grandma. Right? No one else can save you but Jesus, Jesus alone. Paul commends the Thessalonians. I love these verses. They capture so much. He's commending them for their repentance and their running to Christ. He says, listen, this is how you turn from God, uh, turn to God from idols. So part of repentance means I turn away from the, the, the rebellious, sinful ways that I was inclined to before. I turn away from that and I turn to God. Christ. To, to what? To serve Him, the living and true God. And what do we do while we serve Him? We're, all, we're waiting for the Son to return. The Son who was raised from the dead, that is Jesus, who is the one who delivers us from the wrath to come. If you want to be delivered from the future that is coming, the fearsome, wrath-filled, day of judgment that is coming, the only person that will deliver you from that is Jesus Christ. So our response this morning, we have an empty tomb, friends. The grave is empty. The stone is rolled away. The guards are catatonic on the ground. The disciples are rejoicing. And Jesus is greeting those He loves. How do we respond to this in all of these things? I just ask this question. Where do you stand with King Jesus today? It's so easy to just live your life almost indifferent to the reality of Christ. It's, you can be so busy, right? You just stuff going on, and then a week passes, and a month passes, and 10 years pass, and I haven't really given him a thought. But today, there's an opportunity for you. He's calling, come, come to me. All who are weak and heavy laden, I will give you. Are you sick of sin and stumbling around in the dark? Come, come to Jesus today. Have you bent your knee before your king? Has your tongue confessed Jesus, you are my savior. Jesus, you are my Lord. I'm trusting you alone I want to treasure you above all else. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Let's dispel any notion that anyone here is going to be good enough to be right with God on our own. That's, that's basically the sum of world religions. Fill in the blank. Every single world religion has as its goal, basically, be a good person. Try to be enough. The biblical gospel says you'll never be enough but there is one who is. Jesus Christ. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? He puts the question to you today. If you're staring death down like all of humanity is, and you're asking the question, 
What do I do with this? How do I deal with the reality that I am a sinner and I am rightfully dying because of it? What's the remedy? The answer is Jesus. The one who changes death into a door. To life forevermore. It is not death to die, Jesus says to us today. The testimony is this. I love how John sums this stuff. God gave us eternal life, and this life, the life is in His Son. Whoever has the Son has life. It's very simple. Whoever does not have the Son does not have life. The difference between heaven and hell is Christ and Christ alone. Are you looking to Him in faith? Are you trusting Him? Three things just to call us to today. Turn from sin. Treasure Christ. Trust and obey Him as Lord and Savior. Right. So turn. You may have come to the church today and, and your life has been going this direction. You kind of just live and you're just going through life. And God is calling you today to turn in about face. Turn from sin to Christ. Treasure Him above all else. You don't have to throw away your, your vehicle. You just have to stop bending your knee to it and worshiping it and pouring your heart and soul into whatever it is that, that is the idol that calls to your heart. You have to call it what it is. It's just a thing. This is the treasure. His name is Jesus. And then trust and obey. Trust and obey. Believers, here a word to encourage you today. Make sure you pay homage to the king. Consult him in your decision making. Look to him with all that you are. Your life is his, not your own. You've been bought with a price, so glorify God in your body, in your career, in your neighborhood. Think first and foremost, how can my life be surrendered, my knee be bent, my tongue confess that I serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Let's pray. Father, we celebrate the love that You have shown us in such an undeserving situation here. We, the rebels, the sinners, those who reject You, who even suppress that You exist and would like to live our lives as our own God, to be our own sovereign, to serve ourselves, to glorify ourselves. Father, thank You for showing us love undeserved in sending Your Son, not because we were worth saving, but because You are worthy. You showed Your value, Your goodness, Your grace and love in sending Your Son to bleed and die on a Roman cross to change us from the rebels, from the haters of God into those who reflect Your righteousness and then call this Gospel to the ends of the earth. Father, we can never be righteous on our own. We, we, we are rebels and sinners and haters of You. We, we don't have what we need. And so we celebrate what You've given in Jesus. He's everything that we need. I pray if there would be any here today, O oh Lord, stir their hearts. If they have not yet trusted Jesus as Savior, then stir in them the very faith that they need to embrace Him as Savior. I pray that they would run to Jesus and, and trust Him with all their heart to be their hope alone in this life and the next. I pray for all of us here who have, have done that. I pray that there would be an increase of value and treasure of You, Lord, that, that more than ever we would treasure You and run from idolatry. And Father, I pray that we would joyfully surrender before Your sovereignty as your son sits and rules and reigns, may he be the king above all other uh, authorities in our life. We exist for you, O oh God. We want to please you, Jesus. We honor you and we bend our knee before you together today. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.